Well, good evening. I'm Robert Polito, director of the New School Graduate Writing Program, and it's my immense pleasure to welcome you to this nonfiction forum with Joan Shenkar on the occasion of the publication of her great new book, The Talented Miss Highsmith. This book is smarter, more formally daring, and more elegantly original than any recent biography that I can think of. Part of what makes it so extraordinary is that she dispenses entirely with chronology. And from a biographer's perspective, this first of all introduces an immense difficulty. It means that you have to keep all of your subject's life present before you at every single moment of the writing. You can't just check things off and move on to the next thing. But what this does, it, it allows for a savvier and cannier route through this extraordinary life. And let me read uh, a couple of paragraphs from the opening note on biography in the book. There may be many reasons to set down the life of Mary Patricia Highsmith, but this one is mine, to try to catch and in catching to try to think about the constant shifting of identities, from the writer at the desk to the woman who got up from it, from the intensely divided personality to the symbolic steps it took to relieve itself of its burdens that created the consistency, the fierce peculiarity, and the weird, graveled originality of her work. In doing so, I have had to innovate the form of her biography in order not to violate the substance of her life. Obsession, the obsessions that governed her life and inspired her writing, will be the organizing principle of this work. And I think the result is a book that's as dark and audacious and brilliant as the life that prompted it. Joan is a gifted playwright and previously the author of a biography of Dolly Wilde. So please join me now in welcoming Joan Schenker. No one could possibly live up to an introduction like that. I'm not even going to try. Um, and I think I'm not going to hide behind this thing either. I feel much closer to you if I don't have a bulwark in front of me. When an irresistible subject like Patricia Highsmith collides with an immovable object like the fine art of biography, something's got to give. In this case, it was both the writer, she had me on the floor for about six years, she's so frightening, and the form of biography. I did not feel that the usual cradle to grave plot line story of biography was appropriate for a life this interesting. Now, am I talking to uh, an audience who knows something about Patricia Highsmith? Just shake your heads no. Do I see enough? No? Oh, good. So I'll tell you a little bit about her. Highsmith is the most famous unknown writer America has ever produced. She's famous in Europe, almost unknown here. Born in her grandmother's boarding house in Fort Worth, Texas in 1921. She was, she was born nine days after her mother divorced her father, and her mother went off to Chicago to be an illustrator, left her with her grandmother. This was the author of much of her problems uh, in later life, and she never forgot them. Um, she had a wonderful ability to revenge herself in her work, and she never stopped. So her interesting mother uh, was the model for every noir bitch who turned up in Highsmith's writing. Highsmith is the author of two books of which you will surely have heard. One is Strangers on a Train, written in 1950 and made into a legendary film by Alfred Hitchcock. Even Hitchcock couldn't understand how really revolutionary her work was, and he toned it down. The second book, The Talented Mr. Ripley, You've all seen the Vogue magazine version that the film produced. Again, a work so frightening that no film has ever approached it. Her basic subject was two things. One, uh, an unexpressed homoerotic attraction 
between two men who felt uh, as though they were parts of each other and as though they also had to kill each other. This happened in The Talented Mr. Ripley and also in Strangers on a Train. They do each other to death. Love and death, she's our most classic Freudian. Love and death are never, never separated in her work. And one of the ways I'm going to tell you about tracking her produced some very interesting revelations about this. And I want to move quickly to form. You have an idea of this person now. Um, a woman who, who always had murder on her mind, who was so seductive that she could walk into a room and every man and woman in it would fall on the floor. I have had interesting old men well into their 80s and 90s tell me with tears in her eyes how beautiful she was. And women of a certain age, the same thing. Her preference was for women, though she continued to try men out, hoping one would work. They never did. Um, the bar was raised too high. The, the inspiration that women provided her with each one another inadequate substitute for her mother never ceased. Um, I want to talk a little bit about form. Because Highsmith organized her own life around obsessions, and her obsessions were many and frightening, uh, I thought I should do the same with the book. One of the ways that life writing makes life evident to us is if the biographer has the courage to enter the life of the subject completely. That means you have to surrender yourself to another life in a way that you will never do with a lover, with a friend, or even with a subject you're thinking about. Um, I had to give up all preconceptions about what it is to be human because everything human was alien to Highsmith. And when I began tracking her, I, I began also to use her own methods. She loved to stalk her lovers. I began to stalk her. Uh, love and death were inextricable in her mind. I began to find places and I began to make maps of these places, and some of them are published in, in my book, I began to find places where she had made love and in life, and then killed characters in her novels at those very same addresses. So you see a pattern of love and death just moving, moving, moving through her life. Also, uh, murder to her was as interesting and as important as love. Uh, many reasons for this. One of them being that from the age of 12, and this is just one more thing added to the long list of interesting obsessions she had, she decided that she was a boy in a girl's body. She was not far from wrong. So not only was I tracking an obsessive, homicidal, oh, alcoholic lesbian, I was also tracking someone who never ceased thinking about crime. So every investigation I, I made was also the investigation of a crime scene. Tracking her life was like writing an episode of CSI. Um, and I found myself becoming a bit of a criminal also. In, or as all biographers do. Do you all know this story, um, Henry James's wonderful novella, The Aspern Papers? Am I talking to a... Would you like to tell them that well, wonderful story? It's, it's about a biographer. It's a great story. 19th century Venice. An English not-so-honest gentleman decides that he would like to get from a very old lady who had once been the lover of a famous poet a stack of letters, love letters, that this poet had wrote, written her. He, the woman has been immured for decades with her niece in a palazzo. Uh, he schemes his way into the house. He makes the niece fall in love with him. The niece is determined is ready to give him the letters if only he'll marry her. Um, he decides he'll steal the letters instead. He walks into the old lady's room. He gives her a terrible fright. She dies. 
uh, the niece, instead of he fails to marry the niece, the niece burns the letters, everything goes up in flames. That person who broke into the palazzo, wanting those letters, is the very image of a biographer. That's how biographers behave. Dishonest, they'll steal anything in your house. I had to interview 300 people for this book, and I interviewed them at least 10 times, because it's only the, at the fifth conversation that people start telling you the truth. You have to be very careful, and that's another thing I want to talk to you about. Um, I have been interviewed for a few biographies myself, and almost every time I've been badly interviewed, people don't know how to talk to other people. I've had a particular problem with academic interviewers who always come to you with a theory. Um, no, you must be wrong about this when they should be collecting evidence. So I started to, I tape all my interviews and transcribe them, and they're not interviews anyway, they're conversations. Um, I began to listen to the way in which I was interviewing people in order to train myself not to talk to put in a word every so often. And if you really listen to yourself, you'll find you talk much too much anyway, just as I'm doing now. The odd word, nicely placed, can elicit the most interesting testimony. And these people were literally presenting me with their lives. There was not a moment in which they weren't giving me something that was dear to them. So I feel very grateful and humble uh, that I was able to receive this testimony, and I stay in touch with all of them. And that's something you will do, too, if you are ever interested enough to write a biography. Um, the second thing about form I want to tell you is um, most biographers don't seem to think of themselves as artists. That is to say, um, biography is really a serious art. It exists at the intersection of at least 12 other arts and disciplines. Uh, you have to be a psychologist. You have to be a prose stylist. You have to know biology. In this case, I had to work up a fine um, expertise in gastroenterology, blood detection, because I had Highsmith's blood analyzed. I wanted to see what her blood type was. Oh, it was very interesting indeed. It was just as divided as the rest of her. So, and in order to get inside her, and in order to get inside any character, you have to do this. So, I had two problems. I had to recreate this extraordinary character, and I also had to create the voice of the narrator who would tell this story. The narrator couldn't be me. I was terrified of her. By then I was overwhelmed. I was sitting in the cone of depressed darkness that she put around herself and her stories. So I began to read light English novels like those of Nancy Mitford, and it raised my spirit so much that I was able to approach her in a Highsmith in a humorous way. So I wrote a witty book about one of the scariest people on earth, and approaching her humorously allowed me to access her most extreme qualities. Um, another thing I want to mention is evidence, and that's why these genes are hanging here. Now, Highsmith, who, although she was born in Texas, almost never came back to it. She came from a, a ranching family. Her favorite cousin was a famous rodeo announcer. The entire family wore Stetsons and cowboy boots. To this day, they are charming, wonderful people. She hated every one of them. But when she was in Europe, she dressed more or less like an off-duty cowboy. And she was famous for her 501 Levi Strauss jeans. This is a pair of jeans she wore during her 10-year residence in Europe, in, in France. Um, and if you're lucky enough to come upon a piece of evidence like this, you want to examine it for traits of the person who owned it. Because not only is her DNA still on this, these jeans, they retain the shape of her body. 
and many of her traits. And let me just talk to you a little bit about them. Um, Highsmith was incredibly frugal. Cheap is the word we want to use. As a multimillionaire, she used to steal tips from waiters. She'd drive 60 miles for a cheaper piece of pizza, spending much more money on gas than she would on the pizza, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of stories about this. So as you can see, these jeans have been bleached out of their minds. She was an avid gardener, always on her knees in the ground. She loved pulling plants up out of the ground. It's another way to murder something. <laughs> Gardening is a very violent activity. You are always having to decide who lives and who dies. That's why I'm a complete failure as a gardener. I could never bear to weed. The weeds seemed as interesting to me as anything else. Um, she bleached these over and over again. Um, so turbulent was her inner psychology that she used to iron for relaxation. The sight of a flat iron going over material was very calming to her. You will see that 25 years after she had them, these jeans are still, they still retain the ironing lines that she made. She was extremely skinny and had very long legs. So she, even though these are, jeans are 35 inches long, she let down, she had to let down uh, their cuffs and you can see her little perfect Boy Scout stitches on the jeans. So uh, this is just a few of the things I confirmed or learned about her by looking at these things. And that's what you have to do with every piece of evidence you get. You have to treat it, especially someone who fetishized objects as much as Highsmith did. They appear in her works over and over and over again. People are always wearing jeans. They're always, they're all her serial killers steal rings from their victims. There are these objects that she loved and her eyes moved over the surface of the earth like a camera dispassionately recording the things that interested her. So again, uh, oh yeah, one more thing, obviously, they're boys' jeans zip up the front. A woman who thought of herself as a man in a woman's body would naturally buy boys' jeans. And anyway, all of us buy boys' jeans. They're better made. Um, I think I've thrown out enough things for now. Why don't you take it, Robert? So I think it, it should be obvious to even people who are hearing about Patricia Highsmith for the first time that this is an extraordinary life. And I think um, it would have been an extraordinary life, I think, if told in chronological order. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. how soon into the project did you make the decision to write the kind of book that you wrote? Oh, I, I always knew that I couldn't do a conventional life of Highsmith because all her childhood anguishes and angers were always present in her mind. They were revolving in her mind. It's not as though she had a childhood, then moved to an adolescence, then grew up and did something else. Like most really talented people, she never developed. She started as she began, uh, obsessed with death from the age of three and a half. She wanted to kill her stepfather. She used to skip to Astoria Park, thinking of ways her stepfather could be obliterated. Um, she had many grievances, and this, so immediately I knew that I would have to organize it in a way that biography is not usually organized. How did you keep, keep the, all of that information in your head, which is what I was trying to get Just, at in the introduction, because it seems yeah. to me that it, you know, one of the great things about like writing a more conventional biography is that you have these files and then you can put them away as you kind of, you know, the 1930s are over, you've mm -hmm. reached the 1940s. I mean, but, 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 but your book um, seems to do everything at once all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and that's what I had to do. Um, it, I, how did I keep, the, with great difficulty, I think. I, I, because Highsmith was obsessed with lists, 
She loved to make lists. It gave a kind of order to the turbulent psychology that she lived with every moment. Um, I too began to make lists because she was obsessed by maps and map making. Someone that deeply lost would always want to make a map. And there's not a letter that she didn't send out that didn't have a, a list or a map in it. I too began to make maps and publish them in this book. That's the way I discovered that she, wherever she made love in life, she ended up murdering at least one character in her novels. Um, and you really have to, there's this wonderful Greek word, ambulomancy. It means divination by walking. You've got to walk in the footsteps of the person you're tracking. And once you see what they see, put your feet where their feet have been, speak the languages they spoke, you're going to learn something in a deep, deep way about them that you cannot learn from trolling through their archives, which I, I did that too. The other thing about Highsmith, she was hypergraphic. She has the biggest archives located in the most expensive city in Europe, Bern, Switzerland, where I had to spend a year and a half dispensing my advance on the book very quickly. Um, and so I tried to do what she did in order to make a shape for the book that would hold the shape of Highsmith. Just the way these genes still retain the feel and look of her body. That's what I wanted in this book. I mean, the way I interpret what you're saying is, is in two ways. It seems to me one is that the, the life that a person led demands certain formal decisions on the part of the biographer, that, that you wouldn't write a biography like this about somebody else. Absolutely not. And the second thing is that um, the way that the list seemed to have worked in her life was kind of controlling all of this mm -hmm. chaos. And I think what you're suggesting also is that once removed, the list that you made from her chaos allowed you to sort of control the material of this project. Well, it's mimesis, you yeah. know? You begin to imitate yourself. Exactly. You have to be very careful not to do a lot of it. I'm still recovering from being locked up in a room for eight years, which is how long it took to do the book. And to think about it, that's the other part. The way book contracts are set up now, and we all know, we have all suffered with these, is that you're supposed to deliver a book in about half the time it should take you to write it. So what you have to do is fight your publishing company all the time. Um, because it takes a long time to live a life, and it takes a very long time to write about one. And you should at least spend as much time thinking about that life as you would writing about it. The thinking part was really important to me. Um, although I always discover what I think when I'm writing, I had to do a lot of extra thinking about Highsmith because her prejudices, among other things, were so hard to bear. She's anti-Semitic, you know, every, so what, finally, you know. Um, <laughs> It, it was much most unfortunate since she got a Jew for a biographer. Uh, so these things kind of even out. But um, it meant that I had to get bigger. I had to get larger than the kind of prejudices that would make me react and hate her for being anti-Semitic when she had many other parts to her, not to mention a whole lot of Jewish lovers. So uh, being a very complicated person. So. It, things are never simple with biography, as you know better than anyone. Well, yeah, but I mean, um, yeah, they're never simple. And um, you, you have to do so many things simultaneously, which is including if, you're, if your subject was a writer, you have to be a literary critic. That's right. And, and I wonder how you balance the relationship between telling the stories you wanted to tell and accounting for the, the novels and stories that you wanted to account for. Because as, as in her life and lots of writers' lives, there's a very 
complicated relationship between the work and the life? Mm -hmm. um, um, that's a really smart question, and I'm going to give you a really cop-out answer. Okay. Um, I, I referred it to my unconscious, which is the art part of biography, and I allowed that to do the organization. Once I had sh saturated myself with the life, once I had read everything she ever wrote, once I had seen the places, she entered the houses, she tracked her, something happens that you can't account for. That would be the writerly part, you know, where it all cooks together. Your writerly and part. My yeah. writerly part, that's right. Everyone has their own yeah. process. And I would hate to, uh, that's why I don't teach writing. I teach people to see different possibilities. There's a difference, I think, and, uh, and a significant one. Um, it would be awful if somebody tried to copy the form of this book because it's only appropriate for Highsmith. Each life suggests another form. Each person here is completely different from the person sitting next to her or him. So why would I write any of your stories, starting with your birth, your education, your, I'd want to pick out the significant things in each of your lives and let those direct me, rather than trying to impose a form on a life whom I'm just learning about as I'm writing anyway. So it's very, I, that's why I think biography is the, certainly the hardest thing I've ever tried to do. I don't know anything more difficult in terms of making art, and I've practiced a few of the arts. Could you talk a little bit about the choices you made as you went along? Like once you decided on this shape for the book, how did you, de how did you decide what would go where? Because, I mean, it isn't always self-evident that something belongs here rather than in another section. Um, a, a lot of the stuff, material moved around as I went, and that's the one thing computers can do for you. I'm desperately trying to get back to writing by hand, but it won't be too soon because uh, that wonderful drag and drop possibility really allowed me to to decide that this piece of material would do much better in the organization the in the part of the book that dealt with alter egos rather than with death or, yeah exactly yeah. so even though it's they they radiate and resonate from one side each one another. has to beg and borrow from the other and they are all under the supervening theory that obsessions were the best way to get to her. And, and, but also, it was loose enough so that I could drop something in if I just felt like it, you know, which is often a wonderful way to do it. Well, because I think one of the ways the book is organized is these rather long chapters, but in short sections mm -hmm. that, that, are, that are like, you know, in a way, like somebody pushing through an obsession in some ways. Mm -hmm. like, like you you think you've reached the end of the chapter, then it starts again on, mm -hmm. the, on the next page after a little bit of white space at the bottom of a... That's of a how her mind yeah. moved. And mine is still moving that way, and it's, I have to, it's going to take another year for it to calm down, I'm sure. One of the... There, there seems to me like there are, there are two common kind of pitfalls, biographies of artists. Like one is to barely mention the art at all, like as if mm -hmm. the person really wasn't an artist but just happened to live this life and you were reading this book despite the, the songs they wrote or the paintings they made. Or the other is to just let the work completely take over. But mm -hmm. it seems that part of what is so accomplished here is that it's very measured, both in the evaluation of the work but also the, the way that you handle the work. Was, was that... Always the same, or is that another thing that changed as the book went along? I, again, it was directed entirely by Highsmith's life. She's our most autobiographical novelist. Everything that happened to her shows up somewhere in a novel or a short story, either for revenge, and I do love a good literary revenge, and she got a lot of them, or for disappointment, or for, as she said, she wrote the things she wished would happen. So she would often take a story from life that ends happily and kill the person 
um, because murder was on her mind. She couldn't help it. The point of every novel she wrote, except one, and we might talk about that, was murder. If she, it almost didn't matter who got killed. The murder was so important, and, and its effect on the psychology of the person who does the murdering. That's what distinguishes her from crime, most crime writers. She's, as I say all the time, not a crime writer, but a punishment writer. She's interested in the psychological punishment that follows a crime. She was so tempted to crime, to commit crimes herself, and did not do so. She, well, many crimes of the heart, of course, but her chief desire was to fulfill herself completely in her work, which is why the art and the life had to be so balanced in this. In another person, in another biography of another artist, probably not, you know? Well, it was interesting to me that you mentioned Henry James, because I mean, I think one of the ways in which um, certainly the Ripley novels work is that they're very much in the tradition of Hawthorne and James, of the American innocent in Europe, and I think they're probably the darkest oh, version so of right. that telling. Um, how do you view her as an American living in Europe in, in the light of that? Theme? Oh, I, I think she's as American as rattlesnake venom. You can't get more American than Patricia Highsmith. Uh, her boots were always in Texas. Her heart was in some bar in Greenwich Village, and she exiled herself to Europe because, and it's a very good reason, she wanted to get away from her family and she fell in love and over and over and over again. And um, her work was instantly recognized in Europe. In Europe, she's spoken of on the level of Dostoevsky and Kafka. Here, she was constantly removed as a, reviewed as a crime writer or a suspense writer. She's much more interesting than that. Though, nothing wrong with a good crime novel. Uh, <laughs> or a good murder, for that matter, but she took the form and turned it on its head, just as she did that whole Jamesian theory of the innocent abroad. Yeah. Tom Ripley, do you all know the story of the talented Mr. Ripley? Shake your heads, no, if you don't. I see some no's, all right. So, a quick review. Ripley is sent, he's a small-time grifter living in New York, at the very end of his money when magically a rich man picks him up in a bar, sends him to Europe to bring back this rich man's son so he can join the firm. The son is a sort of a, a trust funded, not very good artist in Italy. Ripley gets one good look at the guy, falls into a kind of love with him and murders him because that's what Highsmith characters do when they fall in love. <laughs> assumes his identity, and that's the other big topic with Highsmith, is what happens when the identities of these people begin to penetrate each other, leak into each other. Identity is a very, very poor subject with Highsmith, you, just as it is with her own, in her own life. Um, and Ripley gets handsomer, uh, richer, he goes on, for four more novels, murdering whenever he has to, but ends up in a beautiful maison de maître in France with a wife with whom he doesn't have to sleep too often because he's really not that interested in girls, and um, just doing wonderfully. And that's what she does. That's how people get... Forging art the way he Oh, yes, I'm so sorry to have forgotten that. Forgery, what a big topic for Highsmith. She preferred forgery to any other uh, crime. Ripley likes forged paintings better than the real ones. And one of the side businesses he runs is an art forgery company, the Derwatt Limited. Um, it's there, it's, the first Ripley is a wonderful novel. If you haven't read it, run right out and get it. It is a, it really deserves a place in the pantheon of great American novels. It's the best critique of capitalism I've ever read, among other things, but it's also just a great story. Plus, you root for Ripley all the way through it. 
And that's a difficult thing to do. He's killing, he's you know, murdering, he's garroting, he's pushing people over cliffs, and you still want him to succeed. It's not a small thing for a writer to be able to co-opt you in these ways, which is what she does, and which is why she is so dangerous. When you exit a Highsmith novel, your values are completely screwed up. <laughs> and that's, that's very powerful. She was able to take the darkness inside her and distribute it around her so much that High Smithian has now become an adjective. When I was walking here from Cornelia Street through the slush with little pieces of ice falling and this storm not really happening, I was thinking, God, it's a perfect High Smith day. It's not quite there, it's kind of menacing, there's nothing fulfilling about it, but you can feel that something wants to happen. Now when some, a writer can make you use her name in that way, you know she's had a success, as Thoreau would say, unexpected in common hours. That was a very long answer. No, so. that was a very good answer. Um, and maybe my last question before I open it up to them would be, I, the novel I think you were referring to a couple of minutes ago is the not crime novel, is The Price of Salt. Right? Yes. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that? I will. Um, High Smith, after she wrote Strangers on a Train, which is probably the book that's best known here, her first novel, she wrote her only novel um, about two women. It's a lesbian love story, which has an almost happy ending. She published it in 1952, unheard of for then, a really radical conception for the early 1950s. But she was so, this is so typically Highsmith, she was so guilty and ashamed at being homosexual that she couldn't bear to publish it under her own name. So she published it under a pseudonym. And when finally, in 1990, she was persuaded by her English publishers to publish this novel under her own name, she changed the title. So something about the book was always in disguise. It had to be in disguise for her to publish it. It's a perfect period piece. That's another book I could recommend to you. The Price of Salt. It is very interesting. Last week you gave me a list of your favorite Six, I think it was. Yeah. Do you want to run through that? For yeah. Them? Yeah. If anyone's interested, let's see if they'll be. I wonder if they'll be the same six <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Strangers on a Train, The Price of Salt, The Blunderer, a really interesting story, uh, The Cry of the Owl, The Talented Mr. Ripley, and this Sweet Sickness, a novel I recommend to everyone here. There's nothing like it in American fiction. I think... Um, and the only book I would add to that is The Tremor of Forgery, which I think might be my favorite of them. That, you should tell them about that one, well, since you love it so much. Go well, ahead. Let me, let me just see what questions they have okay. first. Does someone have questions? Yeah. Um, what did she think of the French films made of her books? Um, well, she pretty much hated every film that was ever made of her work. But she loved Alain Delon for his exquisite beauty. And Alain Delon starred in the French film made of the talented Mr. Ripley, which has almost nothing to do with Ripley. But, and plus, they catch him in the end. This is just so not Ripley. Um, but he has this, un do, you, do you, have you all, any of you seen Alain Delon in a film? In, in his glorious years, now he looks like, you know, the Emperor Nero, he's a wreck. But in his 20s, he had uh, an unearthly and criminal beauty. And in fact, he's quite a criminal himself. He's such a criminal, he had to move to Switzerland, which is usually beyond being, you know, one is beyond being arrested in Switzerland. Um, but that was the only comment she did like Alain Delon. And that film in English anyways is called Purple Noon. Right, Plein Soleil. 
yeah. plans for lay. It's worth it just to see uh, the way how a land alone looks. We don't see faces like that here in America now. Can you say what you thought of the American Friend or an American Friend? Well, it had seven directors in it, didn't it? I think mm -hmm. that's enough. <laughs> I think that's all we have to say about that. That's a f yeah. When you come away out of this seven years or six years, is there a moment where you discovered a moment of humanity from her? I remember something, having read the book about her putting a pillow over her typewriter at Yaddo to help this yeah. person. Yeah. Were there any? Oh, absolutely. She. She, she was human. It's she was just everything human was alien to her. That's all. Of course, she was human. She had, she had many. I mean, I had many of her lovers. Too many of her lovers, tell me about her. And, and, uh, absolutely. Um, it's just that it's so much more fun to talk about the bad stuff, which is why I had to control myself in the in the book. I searched far and wide for her last lover who adored her and who made available to me 300 letters. No one has ever seen those letters. 300 letters Highsmith wrote her, the sweetest things you ever saw in your lives. Um, so people, like all really complicated people, she had thousands of different characters inside her. And depending on the situation she was in, and this is a point that is brought out again and again in her novels, she could rotate her aspects and out would come another character. So we all do this, right? You know yourselves that you behave differently with diff around different people. Don't you remember your parents telling you, watch out for your friends because they make all the, they were right. Your parents were right. Your friends really do make, have a great influence on your characters. Highsmith knew this very early on. So that's the answer to that question. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, let's start there and then. Come okay. Back. Yeah, I, I want to use your uh, this idea of detective work as a, as a way of writing also. Mm -hmm. Because I had something happen to me, which maybe it's happened to you, maybe it doesn't happen to you. Uh, I've been 21 years in Lindbergh, they didn't kidnap me. I got my guy. And I got my stuff that I've written, I've gone over. All right, they're like that. All of a sudden, I get some new information about my guy. Okay. And just by a fluke, I reread something. That new information put light on what I reread that gave me a smoking gun that I would never have had until I kept up. You know, you see these TV things, they're always looking over the case again and again. And I say, ah, oh, you're wasting my time. Now I understand why they're looking over the case again and again. But, you know, you've got deadlines to make. People are paying you money. Are you that Not that much. <laughs> in other words, I have to tell you that you remember this stuff. It's like it becomes part of you. So it's not just a fluke that you go over that material again to, to connect it. You'd see the I went over everything until the day before publication. Believe me, stuff was, because I understood her so well in the way, I mean, because I had sunk so deeply mm -hmm. into her character, um, I knew I could distinguish false information coming in from, from uh, there are many examples of this, and I knew right away what was false and what was not. But I, I was still anxious to incorporate anything that could shed new light. The, the real problem, and many biographers run into this, is that you, they don't know when to stop. Knowing when to stop, knowing when you have enough knowing when the story is told rather than over-told or too well told is very, very crucial. And that's, that's part of the art part. You have to make, those are all artistic decisions. Many of them are made unconsciously, but they must be made. So you're working on many, many levels when you're dealing with your, not just the facts, but all those minute decisions, minute. But I, I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I was, there was something that you said that really caught my attention about interviewing people 
you, you have to do the fifth interview before. Oh, 10. 10. Yeah. At least five but, before they start. Can, can you give like an example of the sort of the peeling of the onion, you know, what you get as you go along and what you ultimately get that's different from the, you know, how does that process unfold? Oh, I think for me, because I'm, I've been a playwright for many years, um, the most interesting thing is hearing people talk and reproducing their speech patterns, which I did in the book. Each person talks exactly the way they talk. Often you find evidence reproduced in books in there, and everyone talks the same. It just means that the person has not transcribed the speech patterns exactly. Um, Usually the first people, you, everyone's playing a role. You're playing a role too. You are playing the role of a person who can be trusted. That's very important. Uh, as it happens, I can be trusted, but I also have to play, play someone who can be trusted because I have to convince people very quickly that I can be trusted. I may not get another chance to speak to them. Luckily, I, I did. With these 300 people, I got at least 10 chances to speak to all of them. And I would, you know, call them if I couldn't, couldn't see them. And this was on five, you know, three continents and five countries. And, um, but information, like everything else, comes out very slowly. And the best way I found to elicited is to have people tell the same story over and over and over again. And as they move through the story, either they remember something or they decide to release something that they haven't released before. And that's very important. And happily, I'm just, you couldn't tell it by my talking tonight, but I love to listen to people talk. So it's, it was just fascinating to me. To, and in many cases in this book, and this is another thing biographers don't do, I reproduced pages of one person talking. If they're really fascinating and doing a good monologue, I just let them rip. And you also, find, another thing you find is you have to get there really quick when you're doing a biography. Most of the people I interviewed were in the 80s and 90s, and in some cases, hundreds. So as they're falling off their perches, I'm just there, ready to catch them and tape them. And again, that has to be done tenderly and with um, real attention. So the whole thing is just fascinating. Get Talking to the people is the most fun. That's the good part. Everything else is heavy lifting. But, and except for some ecstatic writing moments. But <laughs> talking to people is just wonderful. You learn so much. Yeah. Luke? She was sort of like a noted missing rope. Pardon uh, me? She was sort of noted as a, a misanthropic, yeah. antisocial person. But I mean, you interviewed, you say, 300 you know, people. Do that. How many of those were directly related to her? Were they all acquaintances and friends? Well, a lot of them were really, that's, that's a very good point. High Smith, who was always presented as this reclusive old oyster in her shell, was once a pearl of a girl in New York City, the most social person in the world. She had hundreds of friends. That was, again, I mean, of course, her favorite mollusk was snails. She used to keep them as pets. She loved anything that was very well protected, you know, anything with a shell around it. She used to live behind houses that had walls and double walls and, you know, high break fronts. And the last house she built herself looks a lot, as someone said, like Hitler's bunker. It's really, it's terrifying. There's a picture of it in the book. Um, you just have to the first thing you learn to shatter in, a, in research like this is what you're told. The minute you're told someone is a reckless, you can just about bet that they've got a really interesting social life hidden underneath it. Not always, but... What do you think was the significance of Highsmith writing comic books? Ah, so glad you mentioned that, because this is something I discovered in a big way. Um, she, do you know about comic, do we have comic book fans in this room? Am I the only comic book fan in this room? I grew up 
just adoring comics from the golden age of American comics. That's Wonder Woman, Superman, Batman, all these characters with alter egos. People, ordinary, mild-mannered people who transform into these gorgeous, flying, you know, Avengers. Um, Highsmith was the only woman and most consistently employed woman uh, during the golden age of American comics for seven years. This was one of the many secrets she kept because everybody writing for comics then was ashamed to write for comics. Such a low, crude form when they all wanted to be novelists and advertising executives. <laughs> but and they didn't know, well, some of them didn't. They didn't know that they were inventing the second big American art form. We've only got two Native American art forms. One of them is jazz, the other is the comic book. Highsmith was right there writing superheroes during the entire golden age. And of course she didn't want anyone to know that any of her work might have been sourced, any of her alter egos might have been sourced from this. So she obliterated all trace of it in her in her archives. And that's another thing I had to find. She used to tell people that she had worked for a couple of months when she got out of college, and every previous biographer has believed that and written it down. She had a seven-year career. So I got to talk to all these marvelous old men, because it was mostly men in the comics than women. It just was no place for a woman, except for Highsmith, who, as they all said, behaved like one of the boys. Well, no surprise. Um, so it was, that was again another wonderful experience for me since I'm a big comic book fan and to discover that, well, it, perhaps it wasn't Dostoevsky who influenced Highsmith so much. Maybe it was Batman and Robin. <laughs> that makes her triply American. Maybe one more question? Anyone? Thought there were more hands up a minute ago. Not a one. Going, going. I think oh, there we go. I have a question. I mean, you've made her so interesting. I'm not going to ask about the writing part, but I'm going to just ask about her. Um, I assume she was never in therapy. I mean, so that. Oh, yes, she was. And not only was she in therapy, I printed uh, her recordings of her therapy sessions. They are a scream. For six months, she was in strict Freudian therapy. She wanted not to be gay. She was trying to normalize herself. Other times, kids, other times. So she was trying to normalize herself. So she went to a strict Freudian therapist, lovely woman by all accounts, who thought it would be a great idea to put Highsmith in a group therapy with a lot of other women who were also trying to normalize themselves. Highsmith thought, whoopee, I can, how many of these women can I seduce? That was her response to six months of therapy. But the therapy sessions, which she carefully transcribed because she wrote down everything that happened to her, are the funniest things. You can see her slowly undermining this woman, this, who, this psychoanalyst who is no match for her, subverting her. It's pretty wonderful. So there are copies of this wonderful book that has so much to teach us about writing and writing lives at the, at the back of the room. And please join me all now in thanking Joan. Okay, thank you. Thank you.